about uh, the Lubeck measure now. So at this point, uh, we have defined things in a rather abstract way. We have given ourselves, well, let's take mu to have these properties, and let's work with mu. Okay, that's fine. But how do we know that we have such a mu? Okay, we have existence problems, and uh, uh, our general problem is a problem of existence of measures. Uh, I, I talked about the counting measure. We didn't really prove that it was a measure. Maybe we should do that at some point. That, that's, that's an elementary one that we can work with. And uh, I mentioned Lebesgue uh, measure in passing, but we haven't really proved that it exists. And uh, well, existence problems are hard in general in mathematics. And in, in my field of probability, which is uh, uh, random systems with many components, the first 10 years were devoted to proving the existence of these things and uh, of these objects. And by the time people were done proving the existence, this poor generation was exhausted. I mean, they, they, <laughs> they really couldn't do anything else after that because they had invested so much time and the problems were so difficult. and, and really different from what we did afterwards. And that happens, uh, I mean, it's really a different uh, question many times to, to decide whether something exists or not. And then uh, when, you, when you finally prove existence and you look at the properties, it's many times another group of people taking over and, and looking at things. And uh, this, my field is at the intersection of physics and mathematics, and, and the physicists were very upset because they were working on these models for many years, and they couldn't understand why people were trying to prove they existed. They, they kept telling us, of course they exist. You know, we, we, we work with them every day. So there was this uh, problem of communication that was uh, difficult to, to resolve. Anyway, so in this case, uh, well, how do you prove existence, for instance, of a Lebesgue measure? So one, one thing is easy is that M, uh, the Lebesgue measure, that's how we are going to denote it, uh, is, you know, you can, you can ask, for instance, to have at M of A, B to be B minus A. Okay, this makes sense. The problem is, what is the sigma algebra? Okay, how, how, well, you can define a sigma algebra, you can take, for your sigma algebra, you can take the Borel sigma algebra. But then, how are you going to define your measure on a Borel set, you know, it's going to look pretty nasty if you pick a Borel set at random. It's not going to, to be nice. And how are you going to define this measure? So you have uh, definitely a problem here, uh, a deep mathematical problem. And there, there are a couple of ways to solve this problem. So I'm just going to describe a little bit things. Uh, we're not really going into the details here. The details are done in the book. Well, the first method, which uh, is, is done by uh, Cara Theodori Dori Extension Theorem, which says the following. Well, if, if I look at intervals only, I have a certain uh, structure, which is not a sigma algebra, which is some sort of algebra. Okay? Because if you do finite union of intervals, you still get a union of intervals. So that's nice. Okay? It's uh, stable in that respect. So you define your, me your Lebesgue measure on that object, which is just an algebra. Then you use this extension theorem to go from an algebra to a sigma algebra. 
In order to do that, you need the notion of outer measure. And uh, di different uh, techniques. And if you look at the book, it's uh, quite a bit of work. You, you, you need you know, several pages of mathematics to, to get there, provided you, you have the right ideas to do it. And you end up with this. Uh, so, OK. So you end up with this uh, Lebesgue measure. However, we'd like something else. We'd like something more, which is we'd like our, so that's a definition. We'd like uh, uh, many times a me our measure space, we'd like it to be complete. So uh, what does this mean, uh, complete measure space? It means that if uh, A belongs to M and mu of A is 0, then mu of uh, then for all E inside A, we have E belonging to the sigma algebra as well. So the definition is a little convoluted. What, what it means is that I take a set that has measure 0. And that's not necessarily the empty set, as you may uh, naively think. There are many sets that are not empty and that have measure 0. Then every subset of my null set is going to be in my sigma algebra. Okay? So it's complete in that sense. You don't, you know, all these things are inside my sigma algebra. Well, it turns out that uh, the Borel sigma algebra is not complete. Okay? So that's why you introduce you introduce a bigger uh, sigma algebra. Okay. So L we call it L is a bigger sigma algebra. Containing B and complete. Okay, it's important to work with complete sigma algebras, otherwise you run into all sorts of uh, technical problems. So that's that's why it's it's a big deal. So L will be the Lebesgue sigma algebra. So in the end, we have our triplet is going to be R. M and L will, will be our triplet, uh, the, the, the real line with the Lebesgue sigma algebra and the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so that's one method to get to uh, the Lebesgue measure. Another method which is very elegant. So this method is done in the book. Uh, another method which is done in Rudin's book, which is a real and complex analysis, But this is a very good book, but uh, I think a little advanced at this level. And uh, it's, um, so it goes very fast. I mean, we we'll, uh, probably will, by the end of the semester, we'll have covered 50 pages of Rudin's book. That's, uh, uh, I, I think that's what we'll do. So it, it, it's really very dense, and, but it's an excellent book. So what he does, he uses Rees. Uh, 
representation theorem. And what that does is the following. You take where well, you, you need to look at, so you, you are given a space, a topological space, uh, X. And you look at the functions, so C, C of X is the set of uh, continuous functions with compact support. Okay, with uh, real values. And then if you have lambda, uh, a positive functional, linear functional, on Uh, positive linear function on CC of X. And your uh, positive meaning, so linear, you know what it means. It means that, you, you know, it's, uh, uh, the, the lambda of the sum is the sum of, all of uh, the different lambda, and uh, you can multiply in and out by a constant. And positive means that if your function is positive, then your image by lambda is also positive. That's what it means to be positive. Okay? So you are, you, you are given all that. Then what the representation theorem tells you that there exist a single algebra M and a measure mu such that lambda F is can be represented as this integral for all well one one way to all positive measurable f well of course uh, there are many things you don't know yet so you may but what's interesting about this is the following. What you can do is define for your lambda the Riemann integral, because we know how to define the Riemann integral on continuous functions. And then extend your Riemann integral using this theorem to a much, much bigger space of functions. And that defines the Lebesgue integral. So if lambda is the Riemann integral, then this guy is going to be the Lebesgue is the Lebesgue integral. So it's, it's very nice because it tells you that the Lebesgue integral is nothing less than an extension of a Riemann integral. That's all it is. Okay, so I won't, I won't say more than that. It's just you know, to describe you a little bit what the problems are and what the different techniques are.
So we'll skip these sections from the book uh, about the actual construction of the Lebesgue uh, uh, measure. Now let's look a little bit at the properties of the Lebesgue measure. First property, if I do a Lebesgue measure of a single real, I find zero. Okay, I take any point in my line and I look at the measure, I am going to find zero. How do we prove that? Well, we could say that x is included in the interval x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon. And therefore, m of x is less than m of x minus epsilon, x plus epsilon. How do I know that this is a Borel set? How do I know that x is a Borel set? Okay. Yeah, we could, we could do an intersection of intervals and find x, or we can say it's a closed set and say that every closed set is, in, is a Borel set. So if it's a Borel set, it's also Lebesgue set, because Lebesgue is much bigger than Borel. So that's why I know I can do this. And this, of course, is open, so there is no question there. Now, m of x is, according to my definition of Lebesgue, this is 2 epsilon. So the measure of x is less than 2 epsilon for every epsilon, it must be 0. Or if you prefer, you take your epsilon equal to 1 over n, and you let n go to infinity. And, and that gives you this, too. So now, if we if uh, my set A is included in R and A is countable, then the measure of A is 0. Okay, Any countable set has measure 0. So it's countable. Therefore, I can write my A as being the union of xi for i larger than n, than 1. Countable means that I can put my whole set in a sequence, right? Indexed by naturals. That's what it means to be countable. So I can do this. Then what else? What, what can I say about the measure of A? It's less than the sum or equal to, because these are disjoint. That's right. But each one of these guys is 0. And sum of zeros is 0. So that's all.
So as a consequence, I know that uh, the Lebesgue measure of a natural C0, the Lebesgue measure of a rational C0, and the natural question is, is it the only way to have a measure zero? Do, do I need, is the converse true? Okay, is it true that if M of A is zero, then A is countable? And the answer is no. That's not true. There are fatter sets that have measure zero. Okay? And that's where uh, the Cantor set is important. So the example is Cantor set. How do you get the counter set? Well, you start with 0, 1. You divide this in 3. And you get rid of the middle part. You get now the union of these two intervals, 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, 1. Second step, you, well, now we have a hole here, so I should try to. You see how my intervals are wonderfully equal. And I do the same thing. I divide these three, these in three pieces, and I keep only the two, I, I get rid of the middle piece. So that would be one ninth and um, one third minus one ninth, that's eight ninth probably, and one third. And same thing here. I keep slicing like this the third of my interval. Okay, and you may wonder if it's not overly enthusiastic. Uh, will, will we end up with something? Or will we have sliced everything? Actually, we end up with quite a bit, as we are going to see. And uh, another way to look at this is to look at uh, the... So, as you go uh, so you do these uh, different steps. You, you go to infinity like that. Okay? You keep doing it. And you, you obtain uh, uh, what's called a Cantor set by doing that. Now, a more formal definition of that is the following one. X, so every X in 0, 1. can be written as a series like this. Okay, you can uh, write your number in uh, the uh, two bases or three bases or as usual in the ten base. So that's just writing it in, in uh, the, the three bases. And your AI can be 0, 1, or 2. Your counter set C is all the axes in 0, 1 such that AI is never 1. So you, in your decomposition, you cannot have a 1. But you may have a 0 or a 2. Okay, So you just get rid of a 1, which is exactly what you are doing here. You see, the, the first a1 equal to 1 corresponds to this interval. 
So if A1 here, this corresponds to A1 equal to 0, and this corresponds to A1 equal to 2, and this one to A1 equal to 1. And then the following step, you are going to get A2 equal to 0, A2 equal to 2, in the subset A1 equals 0, and so on. So you keep, uh, in order to write your number, your, in order to represent your number, you need an infinite series because you keep uh, zooming in to your number. That's what you have. So that's our definition of a Cantor set. You get this. Now, what's the measure of this set? It's 1. If I had kept everybody in, it would be just 1, because it's the measure of 0, 1, minus everything I have sliced. So what exactly did I slice? Well, I start by slicing uh, 1 third. Then at the second step, I take out 1 ninth here and 1 ninth here. So 2 times 1 ninth. And then because we keep doing this in 2, uh, the next step is going to be 2 to the square 1 27th. And so on. So we have a geometric. Okay? We have 1 minus 1 third uh, one third series from uh, n equals zero to infinity of two thirds to the n. Let's see if this works. Looks like. So we get one minus one third, one minus one minus two thirds. So this is 1, and we end up with 0. The measure of this set is 0. Okay, we have taken out a, a measure 1 set. Okay? Now, that's fine. So we have found another set with measure 0. But how big is it? Well, we know that when we have an x in C, we get x equal to this. And our AIs are always different from 1. So what we do is we define bi as being AI over 2. We still get bi is either 0 or 1, because 1s are forbidden. So our b's are going to be 0 divided by 2 or 2 divided by 2. That's why we get either 0 or 1. And we get a y, which is going to be, we define to be bi over 2 to the i. This defines a function this defines a function f that goes from the counter set to zero one okay to every x I I can associate the corresponding y 
and I claim that my f is 1 to 1. Right? Because if I have someone here, then it has the idea, uh, the idea uh, decomposition in base 2, which I, read, I, I write here. Here there are no restrictions about the BIs. The BIs are either 0 and 1, and that's fine. And I can build my x by using the Bs, by doing the inverse. I multiply by 2. That's all I'm doing. So for every element in 0, 1, I get exactly one element in the candor set. And because these expansions are unique, provided that I have gone over, I, I have not been as careful as I should, because there are some, uh, you need to be careful about you know, the, the infinite repetition of uh, the maximum number. And, uh, and so I should have been a little more careful about that. But that's not a problem. We end up having a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two sets, which tells me that they have the same cardinality. Therefore, the counter set is quite big. In this sense, it has the same cardinality as 0, 1. And therefore, C is not countable. So this gives an example of a measure 0 set, which we call a null set, which is uncountable. Questions? Okay, so that's that's about what we'll be doing in chapter one. Okay, that's uh, that's all we'll be doing in chapter one, and chapter two is about functions, about uh, measurable functions. And maybe it's a good idea to uh, talk a little bit, because we'll be talking about measurable functions. And that's, uh, uh, I mean, we we'll, we'll see that many, many functions are measurable. But it has some link with continuity. And uh, maybe we should talk a little bit about continuity. Okay, so this is some sort of review for chapter two, uh, just to, to talk a little bit about these things. Uh, so if we So if we have an f that goes from some space x to uh, r, usually I'm interested in uh, numerical functions, then uh, f is said to be continuous if for every open set 
open in R, f minus 1 of O is open in X. So we need here to have a topology. Okay, we give ourselves what it means to be open in X. And R is the usual Euclidean topology, and uh, this is what it means. No, not that we need that. I mean, this is a very general definition. You can put any topology you want here, any topology you want here, and this still works. I mean, that's, that's what's nice about this definition. It really doesn't depend on what type of space you're looking at or what type of topology. OK? So that's our definition of continuity. Now, important property. Let's take f going from x to r. f is continuous f is continuous on x if and only if for every a in x and every xn, every sequence in x such that xn converges to a, we have f of xn converging to f of a. Okay, so that's the traditional uh, way to look at the continuity. Your, your function is continuous at A. If for any sequence going to A, you have f of xn going to f of A. Okay, so how do we prove it? So let's assume that f is continuous. Let's take A in X and let Xn converging to A. And what we'd like now is to show that F of Xn converges to F of A. Now, uh, if we do f of a minus epsilon, f of a plus epsilon, we know that this is open in R. OK, we just take an, uh, an open interval around f of a in R. then f minus 1 of f of a minus epsilon, f of a plus epsilon, is open in x. OK? Now, uh, a belongs to f minus 1 of this guy because f of a belongs to this interval. Okay, a belongs to this uh, open interval. So, we exist an R such that <coughs> A minus R, A plus R is included in this open set. OK? 
okay, what it means to be open is that you can find an open interval centered at any of your points, which is in, included in your set. So what does this mean? Well, it means that for every x in here, it means, so I'm just rewriting this, it means that if x minus a is less than r, then f of x belongs to f of a minus epsilon, f of a plus epsilon. And that's the same thing as saying that f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. OK? Now, for n larger than capital N, xn minus a is going to be less than r. Remember, I'm taking this sequence xn going to a. And therefore, f of xn minus f of a must be less than epsilon, which tells me that f of xn is converging to f of a. OK, so this is how you go from the notion of uh, inverse of an open set to the traditional uh, f of x and going to f of a. Okay, so the, the converse is also true because it's the, the, the two things are equivalent. But uh, uh, maybe I should do it some other time. So let's stop here for today.